You might have been through a prep that was absolutely miserable, you suffered, and at the end of it, you realized how many drugs you took for a really poor outcome. You know what, you're a fucking joke. When all you really wanted to do was win that show. All you wanted to do was get recognition about how great you really were. You believed that your body was up to snuff with the best bodies on stage, and that your cycle, diet, and training all should have accumulated to a point where you were the winner, but you weren't. Well, in this video, I'm gonna talk about Joe Brightman's steroid cycle, especially for his current prep that he is on, or even maybe finished at this point. And I want to dismantle it and talk about what is right and maybe what is wrong. So let's get right into this thing and not waste any time. At the end of it, hopefully you can gain some knowledge and apply it for your own kind of prep. The bloody apprentice on television. It's not, it's Brightman Fitness on YouTube. Welcome back to the channel, my friends. We have another video today. It's a rest day today, so no training. Uh, but I'm gonna take you through my full anabolic steroid cycle <laughs> uh, for prep at present. Okay, so we're five weeks in, five weeks, well, five weeks have been complete. Okay, just to be completely honest here, I have to admit his face looks pretty inflamed and you often see this with really prolonged anabolic use, but more specifically, a lot with higher dose growth hormone protocols. It's actually why I pull growth hormone out of a lot of people's protocols within a four month time frame of use because I just want to avoid the facial disproportionate growth and the limb growth too. Not in a good way, like your appendages and fingers and like toes and feet and shit like that grow and it's not a fun thing to experience. And in this case, I think Joe Brightman, his face, especially from when I saw him as a YouTuber maybe three years ago, two years ago, has grown a lot, his nose, his forehead, those kind of things, things you typically see as sort of like a growth hormone abuser. And it's, I'm not trying to say it's a bad thing or even a mean thing, but it's just what I notice. And to prevent it, I usually, like I said, pull growth hormone out for a while after about a four month period, usually a month to two months at least. Of prep. So I'll talk you through how it started and I'll talk you through where we're at now. That is as much information as I have currently. Uh, and I'm sure I'll do another update as far as far when we get further into prep. But for now, this is the IFBB Pro cutting anabolic steroid cycle for a classic physique show in approximately 15 weeks. So that's the video. But first, it is 12.12 in the afternoon. I've just finished all my check-in for the day and I've got this weird feeling inside me that I'm just absolutely starving. I'm gonna fast forward this because we're not here for a cooking channel. I'm so hungry for this, man. Oh. Okay, it, this is just me, and I, I. This is how I prefer to prep. Holy Christ, my brother! He added so many extras to that meal, sprayed fat on top of his vegetables, did so much on top of what was just supposed to be an egg white omelet. In my preference, what I would do is actually add in a little bit different things outside of the extras that he added. I would actually add in things that are high density nutrients, things like eggs, for an example, or a hard cheese or something that's actually going to pay its dividends within micronutrition. And I know what everyone is just saying in the comments, but greens have tons of micronutrients. No, they don't. I've dismantled this so many times in different videos, like one ounce of liver and I'm not a carnivore but it just has wildly more amounts of micronutrients per ounce than any vegetable not even like close in any form of way per gram meats animal meats and animal products generally have more micronutrients by a large 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 margin than any vegetable or fruit in this case because calories are so low I would really love to see something included that would contribute better to his overall micronutrient intake versus a ton of vegetables a ton of oxalic acids which do impair kidney function mind you and sauces and spray on fat like this is just it's kind of a wild amount of shit for me I digress let's talk about what really matters the food um where I get it from how much it costs what that good stuff in the way because when I moved to this is a big concern of mine. I was like oh the supermarkets are expensive it ain't all that bad okay I've chatted these guys out before but the meat avenue is where I got my meat from it's, this is not paid I, I pay for it um and what I've got here is a kilo and a half of lean beef mince extra lean beef mince and a kilo and a half of cubed chicken lean chicken breast that is 175 dirhams which is 30 36 pounds 75 that lasts me a week so a week's meat is 30 quid and I'm on 270 grams of protein I've talked about this a ton I've made a whole video about it on this channel on how you need to move abroad to live healthfully and a whole full life as an American who's self-employed 
avoid Andy, who is a bodybuilder. It's just a very clear benefit. There is a ton of financial gain that you get from being in a foreign country where you're not from and you are taking, yes, a little bit advantage of their system because of their financial situation. But at the same time, the governments in your main country are taking advantage of you with their prices. It's all artificially inflated prices. When I can go to Thailand and buy my whole month's worth of meat for a few dollars, yes, a few dollars. And here in Canada, which I'm not from, I'm just visiting, I can spend $400 a week and not get any of my groceries, right? I got like enough wheat for the, the week, maybe, maybe if I'm lucky. You need to go to Middle Eastern countries, Eastern Asian countries, countries that do have a lower financial infrastructure, which does suck in a lot of instances, but also you can thrive in many more instances. And then the rest really is just like fresh stuff. So this is not obviously a full shop. This is just what I ran out of today. Um, so it's fair to say that we need to taper this up a little bit. We've got fresh tomatoes. I've got my pickles. There's another jar over there. Oat milk for the morning coffee. I've got aubergine, banana, peppers, lemon, massive bunch of coriander, coriander slapped in salad and omelets. Red onions, white onions, and peppers. And then I've got Sprite, Coke Zero. I've got some jalapenos, fresh ones as well. They look tasty. And then two boxes of salad there, which will last me a few days. Obviously, need to top that up. And then water, obviously, you don't drink the tap water out here, so I have to get bottled water. All of this, uh, and also including three bags of frozen blueberries, which is probably one of the most expensive things I buy, was £57. I'm not going to blow anyone away. And that is that, unfortunately, there seems to be this disease going around at the moment, uh, or disease that seems to have been born, particularly in America. I've not really seen any UK, young UK influencers doing it, which I'm quite proud of to this point. But I'm seeing this, this infection, this disease, this virus of young American influencers, let's call them. And they do need to be called influencers now because I've just seen that young, young LA have actually sponsored one of them. Like, I can't remember his name for the life of me. And I don't want to share his name even if I did. But like this, this like young, juvenile, insecure boy whose brain isn't fully formed yet, but they're like glorifying and glamorizing taking steroids and like looking down the camera and like licking their tongues out as if they're doing the hacker in this weird, like seductive, crazed, psychotic way. And to be quite honest, like if, if I really let my chin pout, they make me want to like pummel their, their faces in, which is really violent and I don't want to do that. But that's the thing I get when I see this 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 type of person. And it's that that's Yeah, I mean look, this is something that is really ruining the community lately. And I've spoken out about a lot of people have spoken out about most bodybuilding enthusiasts or even fitness and enthusiasts would agree that the behavior of like young influencers pretty much sucks ass right now, promoting trend use and any steroid use really to audiences who are far below the age of 18 years old. It ruins the face of what bodybuilders and fitness enthusiasts have built for decades and completely puts it down into the psychopathic roid rage thing that a lot of people have as sort of these stigmas against bodybuilders. Also promoting illicit drug use in any context is just reckless behavior. Like I don't care how you try to justify it. I believe that education is really important. Promotion and really explicit promotion, I just think is reckless as fuck. And the worst part about it is it's destructive towards the community. It's leeching the community from the people who are actually putting in the work, putting out really good information and drains those people who have great education, great resources for people who are interested in getting on some sort of pharmacology. It drains those people of engagement and therefore their content goes through the gaps of the algorithm where this sort of bashful sort of ridiculously exotic content that is very interesting to watch because you're like there's really people like this but at the same time is highly destructive is crazy and slowly people who are in to the scene or getting into the scene newly are starting to develop the idea that this is the norm for people who take steroids. You generally get on, act all crazy and shit and slowly make progress over time. And that also they're getting a sort of reinforcement that this is how I need to act for engagement. Crazy, doing injections in camera, walking around with tons of acne. These things are becoming a highlight in the Instagram and TikTok algorithm. I mean, it works. It works and they're making money and it, it sucks because it's so fucking destructive towards the community that they're in and then themselves as well. But is it as destructive as Joe Brightman's cycle? This and tell you what I'm doing. Uh, and I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing because I feel confident enough that the way I put this message across is not going to be a, I'm not going to glamorize it and I'll, and I'll tell you the hard facts. But after six years of taking steroids, I have had surgery for my nipples because I got gyno and I was very careful by the way I was one of the careful ones and I still got it that was a horrible experience one of the worst experiences of my life recovering from, from gyno surgery number two I've had a lot of my hair fall out which is why he's wearing a hat now I've threaded a lot of hair for, for muscle um, and I've probably I've probably uh, and this is the, probably the, the scariest bit and I'm not I'm not worried about this because I think I've changed for the better as a person and I'm in a much different position than I you know, was before steroids but like, there's no doubt my, my, my psychology would have changed uh, undoubtedly and that's just what's happened to this point you know and then the trade off for that is I've grown a lot of muscle and I've built a career doing something that I love and I get to travel the world competing in bodybuilding like 
But for a lot of people that unfortunately see this sort of content and they're like, oh yeah, one cycle won't hurt. And then they do a cycle and then they do another one and then another one and then another one. And they're not careful about their health. They don't take their health supplements. They don't check their blood work. They don't even know what gyno is until it's too late. And then suddenly they're messed up in the head as well because they're taking certain compounds that do impact your, your brain health and, and they are neurotoxic. And that's only the impact now. So, you know, I'm aware that there may be some long-term impacts for me. And I just want you all to be aware that there, if you do decide to take steroids, there will be short and long-term negative consequences for you most likely because not many people are able to take them and not have any of the negative uh, side effects. And the final preface I'll give before I go into what I'm taking is that once you start taking steroids, it will become very difficult for you to stop. Um, now, I stopped for eight months. Like I came off and it wasn't, I didn't I didn't go back on steroids because I was addicted to steroids. I, I'm, I'm, right, I'm actually, I'm really glad that he brought this up because it's a lot of what people tend to ignore and it's like admitting to the fact or sort of being vulnerable to the fact that these things are going to detrimentally impact neurological function and a lot of other humanly functions because it is altering the architecture of the human body at the end of the day. And it's so damn refreshing to hear that someone admits that using these things steals from your biology, basically reconverts that energy or whatever it's sold in, in a sort of sense to muscle. And, and you don't get free lunch in biology. If you try to hack the mechanism, the mechanism fights back, creates toxicity elsewhere. The true, true reality of it is, is if you're going down the performance enhancing route, which I did and I do often help people do, you are going to melt your brains to a certain degree. And these things are permanent. And in the exchange, you get muscles and a career, hopefully. The issue is that most of you aren't doing the whole career thing. So it ain't fucking worth it, fella. Most people will get on gear and just recreationally have fun taking obscene doses of androgens and growth hormone and other peptides. No one in their right mind would legitimately think that that trade-off is worth it, like brain altering consequences for muscle tissue, unless you are making a pretty sizable amount of wealth somehow. I built a coaching business. It allowed me to travel around the world, invest in real estate, and most people just use gear and make the trade-off without any sort of investment in and of themselves. It's kind of really nasty shit if you think about it. Basically what I'm saying here is I encourage you to, if you are going to use something like this or you currently are using stuff like this, you better have an exit plan and you better have a financial plan. And I know that sucks to hear and it's something that not everyone wants to really hear who's taking androgens and certainly don't want to hear it from me, but it's important and you need to be thinking about how can I make money from doing this while I'm doing it. I'm already putting a copious amount of my time into it on a daily basis, so I might as well put some time towards making money out of the thing that I'm already putting hours of my day into. My prep started at 400 milligrams of testosterone and amphate, which is this, 400 milligrams of testo testosterone and amphate uh, injected across the week, but on every day of the week. So 400 milligrams divided by seven, okay? Uh, it also started with 100 milligrams of masteron and amphate across the week. So 100 milligrams injected across seven days. And it also started with 100 milligrams of trembolone acetate. Now, after a couple of weeks in prep, uh, I had noticed a change immediately in my, in my psyche. Uh, I felt extremely detached from my emotions. I felt extremely um, robotic. I felt extremely flat. I was neither good nor bad. I was just nothing bothered me and I felt pretty emotionless so I actually said to Joe do you mind if we take the train out for now I know that it'll be needed at some point and, and I'm okay with that and I'm okay with those effects I don't get angry or aggressive or uh, anything hideous like that but but I did just find that I had no emotion and I live with my wife and I want her to feel me having emotion and I want to feel having emotion so I asked him if we could drop that out for now and we, and we could now that was it so total total milligram per week 600 milligrams um, over the weeks that has escalated up trend has gone out but master has gone up so I'm now taking 400 milligrams of testosterone and anthate and 600 milligrams of master and anthate per week split across seven doses splitting your dose there's a couple things here and i do have to resonate with him and i feel this a lot the feeling of being emotionally flat and almost non-existent in the interconnected web of humans it's like an odd situation and it's not fun at all and i get it a lot when i'm taking trend which does turn me into a productive human being and like i can sit here and work in this little box all day long without ever batting an eye but at the same time it's very destructive for a wealthy life not in the sense of like a monetary thing but in the sense of like having people around you who you appreciate and want to be around and conversely want to be around you. If you have a partner, it's it's really tough to maintain that if you're completely being destructive in a prep, taking compounds that do turn you into that sort of selfless, that do turn you into sort of that non-stoic human being who isn't really considerate of other people around him, isn't considerate of their own feelings and is rather just flat and disconnected from the situation of humanity at large. The other thing is that splitting up your dose 
dosages is so intelligent. I think everyone needs to be doing that regardless. It's certainly a ball ache. Like I hate fucking doing it. And I don't think it's like super sustainable for me because I just always end up forgetting. But the benefits are massive. And if you're someone that struggles with acne or heavy mood swings, then this is kind of for you. And it's also a great way to manage estradiol without having to add in any excess medications like aromatase inhibitors. And it keeps things stupid simple and accurate. It's a brilliant way to handle this situation ultimately. Fat loss supplements, let's talk like politics. So we have 80 micrograms of claim. Okay, this is in, it was escalated up to 80 micrograms as quickly as possible. And it will stay there until we want to pull it, pull it down and, and reduce diet fatigue. Um, Candutor is, in, in, for want of a better term, it has a lot of stimulatory effects. Um, it'll raise- Holy- Wow, wow. 80 micrograms out of the gate is so high. Like that is insane for me that like I would go berserk and my heart rate would just literally be so high. My heart would likely detonate within six hours of taking that dose. That's insane. And I know a lot of people have taken a lot more. My big thing is like, why not just start at 20 micrograms? Even I still struggle with 20 micrograms. Now, again, I'm, I'm highly sensitive. Jeez, you could seriously just add 20 micrograms rather than going full bore out the gate with all of these stimulants, just do 20 micrograms and titrate up as needed for an effect and to prevent the absolute destruction that 80 micrograms can cause to heart morphology. I mean, we're talking about your heart changing in sizes due to stress applied to those beta-2 adrenergic cells or receptor sites around the myocardium. That's dangerous stuff. That's the stuff you don't want to play with as a bodybuilder. Architecturally changing your heart isn't going to lead to anything good and clenbuterol, full stop, is how you do that. Is your heart rate, you raise your basal metabolic rate, um, I think by about 20%. Um, so you'll burn an additional X number of calories per day. You can buy them. Natural supplement, not on the banned list, um, but a beta adrenergic, beta adrenergic receptor 2 uh, antagonist. Um, works similarly to Clen, um, will we'll take up your heart rate, but also helps to work on beta fat cells, which tend to be the more stubborn of the, of the two, alpha and beta. Considering heart health here, he's taking 80 micrograms of clenbuterol, something that's going to stimulate massively heart rate and the myocardium around the heart. He's taking, I can't remember how many milligrams of yohimbine, but likewise, it's going to be the same kind of concept. It's basically oral epinephrine or adrenaline. It's going to do the same exact thing to the myocardium around the heart. It's going to increase the heart rate quite dramatically. This is on top of, keep in mind, he says he likes to drink coffees in the morning, so he's already consuming quite a bit of caffeine. I have a really hard time believing that this guy's heart rate is anywhere near 60 beats per minute most of the day. Kind of concerning. Beta might be some more. Thyroid support. Thyroid went straight in. And this was something I, I queried with Joe. So 25 micrograms of um, T3 and 100 micrograms of, of T4. So just one of each, each morning, okay? Some really important points to that. Number one, uh, it's gone in straight away, largely because the risk to reward is, is quite high slash low. So, so low risk, high reward. Maybe not high reward, but, but definitely low risk. So all the all the data that we have on T3 uh, medication shows that after ceasing use, if you're a healthy individual, um, around three to four weeks after your, your T3, your, your natural production bounces back. So it's not a concern, there's gonna be a lasting issue for me. So therefore it goes in um, and it stays in until the end of the day it comes out. It will not go higher than that. It will stay at a physiological replacement dose as far as I'm aware, okay? The only thing I'm using, which I don't have here with me right now, because I actually ran out more delivered tomorrow, is growth hormone. Okay, that's in at six I use per day. Um, and I split that morning and evening. I used to take it in the morning. I think that it was helping to mobilize fatty acids while I was doing, doing cardio. That's not really the case anymore. We, we're, we're aware of that uh, because the half-life is, uh, or, the, or the absorption time is, is much slower than, than I guess we thought. And therefore it's not being used as quickly as we, as we initially imagined. So that is everything that I'm taking from her. Okay, really critical there. He said that I think, like I think, I think, I think a bunch of times to think is like so important because it's obviously very clear that he isn't the directing the ship here it's his coach which fair enough that's kind of how most bodybuilders do it but there's a few pretty big damn red flags for me honestly one throwing in thyroid right away again on top of like all of this clan and yohim and caffeine like jesus christ your heart is going to be a shit storm but anyways this doesn't really make sense to me what i would typically do instead of like blowing thyroid hormone right into the the scene at the very beginning is i would actually prefer to wait you can see the reason why I'm doing this because usually people hold the most amount of residual fat at the very beginning of a prep and the goal is to shred as much of it off as you possibly can as fast as possible because if you can get that fat off initially you avoid a lot of that drawn out fatigue over a really long prep but also can conserve a lot of muscle tissue when fat stores are relatively high versus when you have to pull weight down when you're already really lean it's still it's you're going to lose muscle no matter what virtually so it's it's a good tactic that i can see maybe what they're trying to do is like avoid having to implement it when the risk to reward ratio of losing more weight is quite high as far as the risk goes but it's also pretty excessive in my mind. Look, I would probably wait until I need to pull that lever at all for fat loss after calories have come down, after cardio has gone up. It's just the only sensible thing.
thing to do for me. And the glutes aren't coming in or the lower back is just regretting to inform you that it's not going anywhere. Then you toss in 25 micrograms of T3 or even just 12.5 micrograms of T3, which I've had great success with in my own preps. To me, this kind of sounds like an easy road solution, if I'm being honest. And there's, there's nothing wrong with it. You're using the tools that you have in your toolbox outside of, you know, causing heart health issues and stuff down the road. The drugs inherently are meant to do something and you're using them for what they do. So I get it. Also, it's probably not the good thing to do for long-term health and the implications of what that might mean for you 10 years down the road. Do you shorten your exposure to drugs with a shorter prep? Probably. So I can see where it might be beneficial, but at the same time, using that much thyroid and using that much quite literally oral adrenaline, the heart is just going to be struggling at every step of the way. The other thing there is that the subcutaneous injections do take forever to reach serum concentrations that would have an effect of lipolysis. This is correct with growth hormone. However, if you know your way around intramuscular injections, or even better yet, intravenous injections, which don't do these, you can get a much faster onset, especially if you do an intramuscular injection in the shoulders or thigh prior to doing any sort of cardiovascular activity. These seem to be the spots that do have the most rapid onset in terms of serum concentration. Don't believe me? and obviously his coach doesn't believe this either, go do a growth hormone test. Take 10 IUs subcutaneously of growth hormone and go test it in an hour. Then take 10 IUs intramuscularly in the shoulder and then go test in an hour. Test your growth hormone concentrations. You will see that within an hour, growth hormone concentrations are through the roof when you've done it intramuscularly. If you wanna do something really crazy and see crazy, crazy high serum levels, you would do intravenous injection about an hour before testing and you would see insane growth hormone levels. You'll we'll quite literally see on paper that it does increase dependent on the injection method. Many of these science bros get too stuck in their head with the research and get lost in actual application. They stop doing their own experiments because this study told them so. Shut the wow. f about the study. Shut wow. the f up about having literally like zero correlating factors to the things that we're applying as bodybuilders and go test against your own hypotheses and you'll likely find out that most of them are completely unfounded and not true. Just a food for thoughts. Just a food for thoughts. I don't know. I don't know anything, apparently. I'm just a... Wow. Just a... Just a guy on YouTube. From a performance enhancing drug perspective, of course, alongside that, I have all my health supplements. So I have heart stack from supplement needs. I have kidney and blood pressure stack from supplement needs. I'm taking um, I'm taking Shilajit for my brain health. Uh, I'm taking Cupazine and Alpha GPC. Not that that's necessarily health, but just for for uh, for cognition. Um, Omega threes uh, are in, and obviously plenty of fruit and veg, and then metformin and tamasartan are both in as well. So that is it, ladies and gentlemen. That's my IFB Pro cutting cycle to get shredded for. My all right. So the the metformin and tamasartan. I would actually probably take these things out during a prep if we have room to. Right. Some people do have pretty hyper states that they just have to deal with as bodybuilders, which makes sense. In most people, you don't need these two things. Metformin more so because it does massively decrease VO2 max and impair muscle respiration, do things that are highly critical when in a calorie deficit. What it's doing is it's a mitochondrial toxin. It's how it increases insulin sensitivity. So you're down-regulating your, your mitochondrial function, which is also inherently responsible for beta-2 oxidization, which is the burning of fatty acids. I don't know. Personally, for me, not two things that I'd like to pair together. If I was just looking at this on on like a static table and saying, okay, why would I take metformin in prep? It might contribute to insulin sensitivity, which might lead to greater fat loss, but also you're gonna have an impairment of cardiovascular efforts that you'll be able to apply. And through that effort being limited, you're going to burn less calories and become fatigued much more soon. Two things I don't want to necessarily instigate in someone who needs to lose a dramatic amount of weight. So to be honest, the cycle is pretty good. It's conservative. If you can sustain results using this dose, I'm impressed by how simple it is. Simplicity often works better. I think most people could prep off of testosterone, Mastron, and maybe Tren. Just as a maybe, it's not even needed. And I think Tren really only needs to be there if it's needed to get harder and look more quote unquote grainier. But that's only if you're lean enough. And I'm going to be straight honest, most of you watching this will never get to that point. I've gone to so many regional shows. Y'all don't know how to condition. It's crazy. But at the end of the day, I imagine I'll probably titrate doses up and continue to escalate them as he gets closer to his show to offset the lower calorie intake and then therefore ideally preserve more muscle tissue whilst getting into that lower calorie environment. Would I personally change anything? Yeah, I would, honestly. I would, for one, remove metformin. I would swap the administrations of GH into an intramuscular injection prior to cardiovascular activity, about one hour prior to cardiovascular activity. I would remove the thyroid unless it is 
absolutely needed. Again, his heart rate is already probably wildly high and I would reduce the clenbuterol down to 20 micrograms. Again, because his heart rate is probably wildly high and that is not good. It is highly dangerous. You do not want to prolong a heart rate being accelerated past what should be normal. To be honest, I would encourage him to grit his teeth and do more work. And I know it's rich coming from a head on the internet talking, but there is a little bit of truth from what everybody says. And in this case, I've prepped a lot of people. I've got shredded myself. I've talked about these things before on this channel and in many posts on Instagram. This is a little bit flawed, but you can take it as you want. If you enjoyed this content, please like, comment, even throw me a subscribe if you could. And if you want to get really ballsy to support this channel, we have a Discord link down below. You can join our community there, ask me questions along with other professional coaches and get direct answers. There is a paid part of the community which helps us tremendously uptake this upkeep this YouTube channel and gets you closer to connect with me by direct access. So let's rock and roll into the next one.